Welcome, Ian. Thank you. Uh, would you like to make the distinction for people who don't read you regularly? Right. Well, I'm Ian Banks um, when I'm just writing the ordinary or mainstream sort of novels, and I'm Ian M. Banks. Um, I think someone called it the world's most penetrable pseudonym. Um, Ian M. Banks, yeah, the end of <laughs> Most it. penetrable, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, um, but do you ever come across people who maybe read one without even being aware of the other? I suppose uh, you could, couldn't yeah, you? Not? So, uh, well, the, I used to, yeah. And at, that time, at one point there was um, some debate on, on the, you know, the early net or web, whatever, about, um, you know, someone was claiming that it definitely wasn't the same person, you know, and it was demonstrably true that, you know, one was a better writer <laughs> than the other. Um, but, yeah, I think now that they put, uh, my publishers put the list of both books in the, uh, the front cover, you know, so it says, you know, oh, right. I buy you Max, buy you Max. There's really no excuse for not noticing this, <laughs> frankly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, people are probably right. Do you consciously write in slightly different styles? I hope not. Um, I live in terror of someone sort of putting all the books into, um, well, entering the whole thing onto some gigantic database and then doing a sort of word search and, and discovering that my, uh, you know, my vocabulary is more extensive than the mainstream. You know, actually, it'd be funny if it was more extensive than science fiction. You know, so I'm actually, I really am writing down to, to science fiction fans, which would just be the most awful thing to do. Um, yeah, I mean, the basically they're all novels. That's what it boils down to. You're still using, uh, you know, characters and plot and ideas and you know. There's, um, stuff happening, basically. So it's just whether it's, you've know, got big spaceships or not is almost irrelevant. It's all, they're all novels, but that's all that really matters. Where did the idea, then, for the distinction come from? Well, I, I assume that M is your middle initial, but, uh, but, it is, but, but yeah. why have the distinction at all? Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, what happened was I'd, I'd done uh, three novels with um, my then hardback for Macmillan, and... Uh, I knew they didn't write, they didn't uh, publish science fiction, and I'd said, well, I, I, I want to uh, publish some science fiction as well. So I said, look, if you want, I'll you know, go to another publisher and I'll use a pseudonym. That was when the, sort of the idea first entered. Um, and then eventually my sort of editor sort of, like, must have talked them round and said, well, why don't we do publish science fiction? Let's, you know, let's do it for the first time. And uh, my then sort of pseudonym was going to be John B. McCallan. Um, well, from Johnny Walker, Black Label, and the McCallum, my two favourite, you know, sort of whiskies at the time. Nowadays, it'd be like John B. McCallum hyphen the entire contents of the Scottish Malt Whiskey Society <laughs> stellars, you know. Uh, at the time, that was my favourite sort of blend and favourite malt. Uh, however, my editor, um, who, who's no stranger to, to, to the, the creator himself, um, he said that he just couldn't remember this, you know, which I find bizarre. So I thought, well, let's go for something a bit more obvious. And, and the other thing, I'd had like this, um, I, I was getting grief from um, sort of some of my family, especially with some of, a couple of my uncles who um, were quite annoyed that I dropped the M, you know, from a name. You know, was, uh, well, not actually Mingus hyphen banks or anything, but um, Mingus or Menzies, uh, it's mm. sort of um, agrophone sort of uh, pronunciation. Uh, it's the proper sort of middle family name, and a couple of my uncles were sort of a bit upset that I'd, I'd, I'd uh, dropped it. He says, but what's the, sh what's the matter? Are you ashamed of being a Mingus or what? You know, five facts. Um, so I thought, I'll put it back to keep them quiet. So uh, like I said, I've... I, I did it. You know, I've, I've spent the last, the last sort of 15 years <laughs> explaining this. <laughs> Look to Winwood is the, well, I was going to call it your new novel, but it's, it's been out, what, a year in yeah, hardback? Yes, but that's um, hardback last year and it's paperback now. Yeah. Now paperback this week, I think you can buy it in, yeah. in paperback. Would you mind giving us your own kind of... Um, uh, jacket pricey. Oh, blimey. Oh, um, <laughs> right, well, it takes that, I'm sure. Uh, your more astute listeners will be aware. Uh, it's titled from Part 4 of the Wasteland by the old Thomas Downs Elliot himself. Yes, the quotes on the inside That's of the front right, yeah. page. Yeah. The first of the science fiction novels was called Consider Flavis, which uh, is sort of the words immediately following uh, Luke to Wonder. Um in the poem, and it was sort of bit, all about a big sort of, you know, galactic sort of war and all the rest of it. It was my attempt at Star Wars, Star Wars, basically. Because you know, that's a good thing about science fiction when you write it, you've got an infinitely large effects budget, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I was wanting to sort of do something a bit, bit different uh, with this one. And you, there's a kind of template, there's a sort of pattern that's developed that a lot of the culture stories for those short stories or, or novels tend to be about someone from the culture who basically gets sort of bored with it because it's just too much fun, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of boring utopia for some people, and they go outside and have exciting adventures and, you know, somebody else who's not so perfect uh, civilization. So I thought, well, I'd sort of do it the other way around this time. So I thought, right, I'll have someone from another civilization coming into this, you know, totally wonderful hedonistic um, culture. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, why would they be doing that? So ah, they're going to kill something or blow something up, whatever, you know, so, um, uh, so basically your, your sort of main character is coming in this sort of nefarious um, intent, 
However, <laughs> <laughs> even he doesn't know what it is. This is a clever bit, right? Because it's. I'd uh, love to see you read <laughs> your novels, you know, in a kind of adult Jack and Ori. That would be uh, very, very. Yeah, I'd, I was offered, uh, you know, from, from do these um, um, you know, audio books. You know, yeah. Said, Would you like to do it yourself? And I said no, because uh, I just I don't like my reading voice. Like most people, I try to stand, you know, to hear myself. Uh, you'd need to be on tape. camera. Uh, oh, oh yes, yeah, hand signals. Yeah, yeah, yeah so I'll, I'll sit my hands. Well, yeah. Very animated. <laughs> <laughs> Bit lucky in the classical, actually. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, yes, I'm, yeah, I have a good face for radio as well. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons I like your writing is that it seems to have um, a, a humour and a humanity as well that seems to be lacking from a lot of science fiction. I, I call it the, um, the, the 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 Star Trek phenomenon, where where the the, the latter Star Trek spin-offs all seem to have this terrible kind of arch. I would be grateful if you joined me in the bridge, Captain, mm. kind of uh, thing, instead of get your ass down here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yet the, all the humanity seems to have gone out of it. And th- no, there's mean, more yeah. than a nod uh-huh. in the direction, for instance, yeah. of, uh, of Hitchhiker's Guide in, in, in your writing, isn't there? I think so, yeah. I mean, it's a book I never did read. I saw the, uh, the recently repeated um, TV series, and I think, yeah, I'm sure it had an effect. I think also Star Trek did have an effect, but probably more as a, something to react against. I, mean, I find the whole idea of having you know, these incredibly um, you know, sophisticated computers or on incredibly sophisticated starships and having still having a captain seemed a bit, a bit uh, daft to me. <laughs> I thought, right, well, the, the, the brain of the, the ship will uh, actually be in charge. You know, it's like the, the brain of... The, 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 the relationship of the, sort of the computer, the, the mind on, the, on a starship would be the same as uh, you know, a brain to a body. Basically, you know, your body is really just a you know, sort of life support mechanism for, and transport mechanism for your brain. It's, you, know, you are your brain, so the same applies to, to the ship. So, um, so Star Trek probably did have a, uh, you know, some sort of influence, I think. Why did you choose science fiction as a medium? Is it something you'd always read? Oh, it chose me, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a vocation, was it? Um, but know, it's not it's generally very highly regarded, is it? I know no, there, there, there are exceptions. No, there yeah. are some very high profile um, exceptions. I think it's just. Uh, a lot of writers, I just wanted to write what I liked, what I enjoyed reading, you know, and what, what you know, most sort of energizes you or excites you is what you feel best sort of qualified, in a sense, to, to start writing when you, when, you, when you want to start writing. What and was that, Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke? Uh, yeah, but that, they were kind of, sort of you know, old, old hat, not like old hat, but they were the old guard, yeah. you know, even, even uh, back then. I was sort of um, reading some of the uh, New Worlds, um, uh, well, well, the New Worlds went from being a you know, proper magazine to, uh, to its quarterly incarnation when it was coming out into a paperback form. Um, there's writers like uh, John Sladek and uh, Mike Harrison, M. John Harrison, um, you know, they were sort of people that had some of the, the biggest effect on me. And certainly you always, you read, you know, your Heinlein, your Asimov and, and Clark. Um, I think the only one that really sort of, I thought, still sort of had uh, a real sort of relevance then, so uh, was probably Brian Aldous, you know, who's uh, you know, still, still around mm. today. Mm. Well, yesterday, up at the festival, in fact. I mean, Doris Lessing. Uh, so it was, uh, I think it's, like, say, so you just, sort of, you, you want to write what you enjoy reading, you know. Uh, and it took me a long time to come around to the idea of writing mainstream. You know, it doesn't look that way because the first three novels were, were mainstream. But in fact, I regarded myself as a science fiction writer. And this sort of, you know, newfangled mainstream stuff was, you know, a bit of a departure. Have you got uh, copies of every copy ever published of 2000 AD in cardboard boxes in your garage? Uh, actually, no, actually, right. no. I was always more of a sort of paperback chat right. you know, than the sort of comic book sort of stuff. I mean, I think... The last comic I used to get as a kid, as, you know, kid adolescent, whatever, was probably the eagle. No, the lion. That's it, the lion. I went from the Bino to the lion and then this on to, you know, books without pictures. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the Phantom Menace. The, the last Star Wars movie. Did, uh, did you see it and did you enjoy I it? I did. Actually, I've got this uh, chum who works in the film industry in London, and he got me. We went to the premiere. Ooh, yes, yeah. in my kilt, I might add. You know. um, <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, Johnny Vegas shouted something at me. I've heard. Since Were you mistaken years. for you and the Gregor? Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> not as such. You know, I can't do my Sean Connery accent. Uh, well, actually, I can't. I'm sure anyone from Scotland can. It's not very good, obviously. You no, know, no, it's it's there, you know. Um, yeah, so yes, I just went 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 to the. Uh, it's very spectacular, you know. But uh, I think see it again, but yeah, they, it all seemed a bit sort of too, sort of, you know, contrived and, and the whole thing about, you know, the, the brat and the spaceship at the end and blowing everything up, you know. Come on. I thought it was very brave to make a movie like that out of a trade war. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah it's a bit, mm, that's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a publisher's dream, aren't you? Because you pretty much write a novel a year and have been doing well, it for a yeah. decade and a half. Have been, yeah. I'm actually. I'm, I'm You're taking a year back. off. Though. I've had a year off, and I liked it so much. I thought I'm going to take every second year off. So I'm, I'm sort of. 
I'm 47. You know, I'm getting on a bit. You know, you can see, you can, you can see no, the years in the like here. You know, so. Uh, so what have um, you done with the year off? Anything useful? Uh, no. <laughs> it's just sort of, you know, more of the usual nonsense. You know, drinking, eating too many curries, that sort of stuff. Um, I, but the only sort of vaguely sort of creative thing that I've done is I've been mucking, mucking around with music. I've got all this sort of. Um, MIDI gear, you know, musical instrument, digital interface, and uh, sort of software and, you know, computer and all the rest of it, and uh, sound modules, and I've been uh, basically pounding away in a different sort of keyboard, you know, the one with sort of the black keys and white keys and stuff, you know, yeah. yeah. Black keys are louder <laughs> than the white keys, apparently, so I'm told. Um, yeah, so I've been sort of, you know, uh, rather pathetically trying to sort of compose music and use my... Is this for Esperdale Street, the musical? Uh, well, not really, sort of, well, uh, well, they're my hang several tales, yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, some of the, uh, well, Esperate Street uh, novel from whenever it was, 87, um, there's been talk about it being turned to a film, and I always said, well, I've got the original tunes, the tunes, in a sense, really existed, the ones that I mentioned in the in the book. So, um, yeah, me and a chum called Gary Lloyd, um, we sort of... Uh, Sort of written the, uh, the, the these tunes and it's sort of maybe going to happen. We'll see, you know. But there is actually a CD of you know of, of music what what I helped write. <clears throat> but it's very good or not, it's not a matter. But uh, yeah, it's there. But this is actually other stuff as well. I wasn't uh, uh, I sort of left that to to Gary and, and Chums. So um, uh, my own sort of purely my own as well. So and anybody else that goes wrong, it's not going to go wrong. Cause I'm not totally want to you know sort of try to establish a new career or anything. It's just fun, basically, for me. It's a hobby, I guess, is uh, what I'm searching for here. You know, uh, establishing your first career was, well, well your, your writing career initially was quite difficult, because you wrote for years, didn't you, before you finally got the, oh, the yeah, Watch Factory uh-huh. published. Well, How many years? I, I did it a stupid way. Well, I, I didn't think, oh, uh, I started trying to write, I wrote what I thought was my first novel when I was 14, then I did the thing called a word count. I discovered it was actually only about 30,000 words long, which is not, you know, it's about half the size of a, even a small novel. Um, so I think it was like 16 when I wrote my first book, and it was about six, no, five books later, and, well, six books later, uh, a million words later, when I finally got published, when I was 30. So it was, uh, I was a 14, you know, sort of year in waiting overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> so does that mean that there are half a dozen unpublished masterpieces? Oh, God, no, I'll tell you, they won't the publish them, you know. <laughs> oh, right, they, yeah, they all have no, them. But, uh, um, Who's got those original manuscripts? Because you used to give them to the oh, yeah, oh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, I had long-suffering friends, poor devils, yeah. Um, yes, uh, I mean, three of them, the first three science fiction novels, well, uh, they've all sort of been published now, but they... Although, to my extreme annoyance, it actually, it actually takes more time and effort to redo an old book than it does to come up with a new one. So, um, however, I thought they were worth sort of doing as doing properly, basically. So the, uh, the, so there's two sort of thoroughly unpublished and unpublishable novels. One with the happy title, The Hungarian Lift Jet. Mmm, pretty good, eh? Um, um, unpublishable uh, one. Uh, 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 not too, have you ever had anything knocked back and said that's simply too violent, too uh, sexy, too perverted, really. no, even no. for us? Well, but in reality, yes, we're not unpublishing, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the well, Hungarian Lift Jet, for example, that was one I wrote when I was 16, and it was... Uh, I'd kind of, I'd, I'd gone, th- I'd left me sort of Captain W.E. John's big old stage behind and I'd gone on to his Alistair McLean films. I thought Alistair McLean's films were great, but they didn't have enough sex in them. So this, this book was absolutely full of sex and violence, neither of which I had any experience of, you know, at all at, at that tender age. Um, How did you write so convincing about it then? I'd read lots of it, that's uh, why. <laughs> Again, it's what you like reading, you know. So, um, yeah, so um, I'd read, like, you know, Friends editions of forum and you know magazines like that sure, well, might yeah. hadn't by him you know, no, no, no. yeah. um and anyone who says it's a liar oh, no. uh yeah so i mean you, you just you know, you've read that stuff like, you know but i'm sure it wasn't actually very convincing i haven't dared go back to to something that old you know have you ever picked up a novel and thought that is too far over the line that that's too violent um, too graphic too gratuitous so. well yes i have but that was mine just very yeah. annoying <laughs> yeah. um I don't think I have, really, no. I mean, as long as it's... Uh, I think it's different if you're so writing a, uh, a novel, that at least you, you're relying on the reader's imagination, you know, whereas I think so it's So you can draw that line in a different place, do you think, from yeah, a movie? Yeah, it's not like film. I think yeah. if you're showing something, if you're something in film, that's particularly... I mean, I don't, I'm not at all bothered about, uh, about sex, I don't bother me in, in, in the least. You know, I think it's not about, um, a sad comment that we're so bothered about it. But violence is different. I mean, if you saw something... Uh, um, 
Uh, and I haven't read anything. Say, I mean, say something, um, a novel that, that featured violence against children. It was, it was really sort of, you know, sort of gloatingly described. I think I would find that, yeah, very objectionable. I certainly wouldn't write something like that. You know, I had my own sort of twisted morality in the novels. And the most um, violent of all the books was called Complicity. Um, but you know, my, my sort of way of, sort of dealing with this was that there's almost no violence in, in the novel um, towards women. It's all towards men. You know, just partly I, I kind of attempt to redress, you know, to, to, to balance out the equation that so, so much um, violence in literature is towards women you know, by men, and, uh, and for that matter, in reality as well. You know, so um, um, so I'm, I need to be a you know, sort of you know, twisted, evil pervert. <laughs> At least I've got my own little sort of brand of morality in there somewhere. Well, you seem very liberal to me, and I'm guessing that of the, the two camps, and they're with brass. I, there is the why camp and the why not camp, and I guess you mm. fall into the... the, uh, the yeah, I, I kind of disagree with censorship, even, uh, even despite what I've just said there, but um, oh, come on, anything that ends up with Phil Collins going, oh, I'm talking nonsense sense. It's just not even good, I'm sorry. You know, just get all the moral arguments. You know, it's just good for that alone. You've won numerous sci-fi awards for your books. Which are you most proud of? Uh, oh... And in terms of the actual books, or, um, you know, awards, I don't know. Uh, I tend to sort of um, forget those, I think. I'm always embarrassed, you know. Thank you very much, very kind. Goodbye. Um, uh, well, I was at Clive Anderson there, didn't I? Again, not very convincing, but slightly. I, I think for the use of weapons, the, the, sorry, sorry, is that the second or the third one? Third one. Um, whatever. Uh, of the science fiction novels. Um, but annoyingly, but I can't really take full credit for it, because uh, my, my chum and fellow science fiction scribbler, Ken McLeod, uh, he sort of rescued the book. It was in one form originally, and then um, I just abandoned it because it was it was bad. It was very it was grossly overwritten. Oh, Acres so of purple prose. Also, the the, the the climax is in the middle of the novel, which made perfect sense structurally, <laughs> but you know, no other sort of sense. And Ken said, "Well, why don't you do it this way?" And he suggested a sort of two track sort of. Um, you think where one sort of element of the plot goes forward and now it goes back and they both meet at the end. You know, I thought, a good idea. So I did it. So it's, I think that's my best, one of my best novels and certainly the best science fiction novel. But uh, like I say, Ken McLeod uh, helped, helped him make it. Oh, so can I, I ask if, if, if anyone <laughs> generally holds the blue pencil and, and has input into your work, anyone acts as a kind of... Uh, well, as my editor. I mean, he does yeah. that. But the good thing is that my editor doesn't really like or uh, understand science fiction that well. So Maybe I can, that's a good I can thing. Get away, well, it is for me. I can get away with more. Aye. You know, <laughs> he's just I'm not sure about this sentence. Language. No, no, that's okay, James. That's uh, that's uh, that's science fiction stuff. And he sort of looks at me sort of suspiciously. But as long as I don't start, you know, sweating or you know, sort of break eye contact, I think. You know. What about your long-suffering wife, who who has to put up with you for two months a year or two months every other year now, mm. uh, holding yourself away and, and oh. typing like a madman? <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, the resemblance doesn't end there. Um, I think she's you know, right. Brings her cups of coffee. Bless her. You know, so sort of, uh, I'm not sort of too. I feel terrible to live with. I don't think. Well, she still works for me anyway. You know. So um, yeah, I think. And the other thing is, I'm a very, I'm a very lenient boss. You know. Uh, uh, if it's a nice day. This is why I write in the in the the winter, in the autumn winter. Um, cause boss to who? Her. What? Oh no, no, to me. I'm sorry. Oh, right. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> My liberal credentials slipping uh, there. Uh, no, I mean I'm very good. I'm very. Uh, I'm self-employed. And I'm just thinking I'm a very. Right. I'm very lazy. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. a nice day. Oh, what the hell? Let's go and have a run in the car or whatever. You know. This is um, a culture novel. It is culture yeah. with a, a capital C. Capital C. Can you just explain the culture? Uh, it's basically where I want to live. You know, uh, yeah. not what can I do? Oh right. Well, that answers before. my next question, which yeah. is, is <laughs> the culture, the culture, your kind of idea of, of heaven. It's my well, yeah, sort of. Um, Sticky as an evangelical atheist, yes, it's my, so, <laughs> my secular heaven. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah, well, you better it's, explain it's what it is then, man. It's basically a very far future um, post scarcity civilization where, um, you know, there's, uh, they, have, they have no money, they um, have no real laws, they're all very well behaved. Uh, yeah, no money, but they're all, you know, fabulously wealthy in, in a sense. And um, basically, machines are in control. This is one of the big sort of leaps that's gone on here in the culture that, you know, it's assuming that um, that's. Probably couldn't make you know, sentient machines. That is, couldn't make you know more of a, uh, a mess of, uh, of of life, you know, of, um, of affairs that maybe they'll actually be. So this is a big, big sort of optimistic leap that's in the cause that the, uh, if you have artificial intelligence, then they'll. Um, uh, the, the, the AIs will actually be you know, nicer than we are. You know? so I don't think it's that big you know, sort of imaginative leap, frankly. I mean, you don't have to open up the papers and see how awful we are as a species, so maybe they, maybe they can create something better. Well, so basically, they're in charge, but the humans have great fun. It's a very optimistic view of the future. There's been a lot of bad science kind of stories in the papers mm. lately, hasn't there? Surrogacy and stem cell research and all the rest of it. You, are you confident that we're going the right way? 
and um, too quickly? I'm not sure about being bothered. Um, I think there's no scientific breakthrough or area of research that we're not capable of making a mess of and uh, adding to human <laughs> misery you know, through. Um, but that's not the fault of the science. It's not the fault of like, you know, the universe. The universe is simply there. You know, we impose our morality on it. There's no sort of... Um, the universe doesn't care. It can't care. You know, caring is not part of, the, part of the equation. So it's really up to us what we, what we do and how we, how we approach. It's not so much just science. And science is fairly blameless. It's the technology. It's what you do with the science. Let me squeeze in uh, one off the top of the pile of questions that have come in via email on the, on the phone. Nick called from Northampton to say, why do the spaceships in your novels all have such bizarre names? <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember some because now. they want to. Um, uh, I just thought it was, it was a lot of what the culture is about, and my science fiction in general is about. It's kind of a reaction to all the science fiction I read when I was a kid, you know, and an adolescent, all the rest of it. And all oh, the spaceships hatch up poor face blinking names I mean the Enterprise <laughs> you know I thought no but you yours are gags in themselves aren't they can you, can you give us a couple of examples I can't I'm uh, oh, uh, there's, there's one there's one that's a, there's really sort of vicious warship right and it's called Frank Exchange of Views <laughs> 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 it's a bit like have you ever passed a caravan on the motorway and caught sight of the little gilded badge that's on the side of it they're called names like Marauder that's right and Invincible the yes. <laughs> <laughs> nothing what? with, with gingham like, curtains yeah When's your next novel being written then? Have you uh, October basically? I start in October. It's always the same time of year. Why well, do you do that? Well, like I say, because it's not very nice weather up in Fife yeah. usually around then. We get occasional nice day, as I say. We sort of tend to bunk off and uh, head head to the hills, whatever. But yeah, I mean, I couldn't write in the summer because I'd be giving myself days off all the time. But if you write mm. in the winter, it's like you know another horrible day outside. Might as well stay and write a novel. I suppose you know. Have we warned you about the dictator question? Dictator oh yes, uh-huh, right. yes. Do you yeah. are dictator. Well, I remember. Today? I remember some of these questions because it was God of the Day and stuff like that, you know. So, look, right, right, don't right, mention God of the Day. Right, Dictator of the Day, yes. Right, well, I suppose you are Dictator of the Day every time you pick up a pen uh, and start writing, but if you could invent a, a law that would apply here on planet Earth, what would it be? Um, aside from the obvious one of restoring democracy. Um, I think it would be... Restoring democracy? Restoring democracy, yes. Well, if you're Dictator, you'd have to, you know, pass a lot to... to um, oh, I see what you mean. Oh, right, yeah. okay, yeah. Um, I think I'd go for speed cameras for pedestrians, you know. <laughs> Pavement rage, it's time has come. Well, uh, minimum speed cameras or, or maximum uh, speed limits? I think both. Yeah. Right, okay, what yeah. people are moving at is actually the same rate all the time. All right. Um, mm, stamp is the next one, isn't it? Stamp. I had a good idea about, about the stamp one. What I think is you have, like, the technically sort of blank stamps, but you can feed them into those things you get at uh, train stations or stuff that like print you in your four photographs. So you can have, like, personalised photographs. You can have, everybody can have their own little stamp. Isn't that a nice idea? That, that's, that could catch on. Um, National Anthem. Um, I don't think you can beat the South African one, which I can't entirely pronounce, but it's something like Nsikwe Kukulewe Africa, whatever. It's just brilliant anthem, the best in the world. So I think something nice and short, because it, let's face it, everyone gets bored listening to you know, anthems all the time. I think go back about ten years and use the, the BBC uh, television nine o'clock news theme. It's only about ten seconds, but it's fine, that'll do. I thought when you said the, uh, restore democracy at the beginning, you weren't referring to yourself as a dictator, but uh, to, to the way we've lost our way in this country, because yeah, I know you're, oh, right. you're, you're, you're very political and you I described, I think, as one of the most joyous days of your life, May 1st, 1997, when, uh, when, when Labour were, were re-elected or were, were elected. Mm. Uh, and Brian Cox is in the paper today talking about his disillusionment. Are you a bit uh, disappointed? Oh, yeah, I thought? think. I mean, I was... Um, I haven't, I've never voted new Labour. I used to always vote old Labour. So I suppose I was an old, old Labour man, you know. Um... Uh, you don't know who to vote for anymore. Well, no, no, it's in Scotland. It's dead easy. Tommy Sheridan and his, his, his <laughs> merry men, the Scottish Socialist Party. <laughs> okay, I actually have the S word in their party title. Wow.